Homelessness 2.0, day 34. Cracked my phone screen again. That's fun. So now I have to replace it again with, and unfortunately I didn't, you know, take it back to storage. So I've got to, I got to do that again. And then I don't have any more protectors. Um, hardwood floors would not recommend. Nope. Gotta love carpet. Carpets, for me, carpet is just an easier life. It's a more comfortable life. Um, it is a less hazardous life. It's a less dangerous life. Um, I think it's like close to noon, maybe. 11.30, close enough, I guess. I mean, I woke up around 10, kind of on my own. No construction today, it seems. If there is, they're not using power tools and crap. <clears throat> I want to clarify something uh, from another video, or at least attempt to clarify, because me trying to clarify things without having, like, someone actually asking questions with the back and forth kind of thing. Um, hard for me to clarify. But... So regard to homes in general, the idea of a home, home is where the heart is, as, as they say, whoever they is. When I was homeless for the first time, back when I lived on the streets in a tent, obviously that wasn't my home. I was, I was getting woken up almost every day at like 6 a.m. by the cops. I don't think the average person who lives in a home experiences that. I, in, you know, on some of those days, I would be threatened with arrest. One day, specifically, there was this extremely aggressive uh, cop. And, <clears throat> like, not only did she whoop whoop to wake my ass up but like within seconds was at my tent shaking it telling me to get out and then asked me for my fucking social security number and then threatened me with arrest for not doing it if I didn't give it to her um and it's like that's that's obviously not home now Am I dealing with that right now? No. But I have no sense of guarantee of staying here. Like, I don't have enough money to continue to stay here on a regular basis. This is supposed to be a temporary living situation. And that's also part of that. It's like, when you are on a regular temporary housing situation when when your housing is not directed by you in some substantial way you are not you are a homeless person <clears throat> like okay let's say I had an influx of ten thousand dollars a month Let's just say, all right, $120,000 a year. That's a lot of money. I could do a lot with that kind of money. I could do a lot more with that kind of money than most people who have that kind of money because I've been poor, because I've been homeless, because I've lived off of $400, $500 a month for more than a year of my life. <clears throat> Let's say I had that kind of money. I could live however I wanted. I would no longer be homeless in that respect. As long as that money continued, it doesn't matter how I'm getting it. As long as that money continued, it wouldn't matter if I had my own like house or my own apartment or even if it was I never stayed in the same place for longer than a couple of months. The thing is, is that... <coughs> <coughs> In a situation like that, I am in control of my housing situation. I am the one who is making the decisions as to where I will be living in the future. I will not be leaving it up to somebody else 
to say yes or no. Now, of course, in some respects, that will be there. You know, if I'm trying to find an apartment or whatever, that's a little different. But I could just live in hotels for the whole time if I felt like it. 10000 a month is easy to do. I could live in, you know, Airbnbs the whole time if I felt like it. Because 10000 a month would totally allow for that. <clears throat> and the thing about that is, is that the choice is part of it. The choice of where you live is really important. Now, of course, when you grow up somewhere and you live where you were born, there is a there is that sense of belonging. And, and even though it wasn't a choice, you lived there for an extended period of your life. I mean, even when... I was a kid and we moved around a bit and it wasn't military related. It was my parents doing whatever the fell the fuck they were doing. We still lived at each place for a couple years at least. So it's like to go back to the home is where the heart is. And this is also with people. It's when you're so accustomed to a place that you don't think about the fact that you're going home. Even when you say you're going home, you don't think about the concept of home or even homelessness. You don't think about the other options. You don't think about the what ifs. It's just habit. It's rote. When you drive home from work and you take the same route and then one day when you do it, maybe you're just a little extra tired and you're like, did I run red lights? Oh my God, what happened? How did I get home safely? Because it is such an ingrained pattern in your life. And I'm not saying necessarily the pattern itself is home. It's the idea that home is this concrete thing but is so ephemeral in your mind that it is a habit to just go to that place that's home that's why it takes months i mean if if you or anybody else who is you know is watching this or rather if you are watching this <clears throat> and you've moved recently it probably feels weird to call your new place home. That's the same thing with anybody. Whether they have been homeless or not. Home is where you've settled. Home is where not only you've been, but you expect to be. When I stopped being homeless it wasn't when I got a place it was when in my brain I realized that I had been living somewhere longer than I had been homeless <clears throat> that's that's for me that's how it worked like I was homeless for two and a half years I didn't start feeling a sense of home for at least a year, but then I would still recognize that, yeah, but I was homeless longer than that. I had a benchmark to work on. Like, I had real world experience that said a year really isn't that much. Not compared to the fact that I had lived homeless longer. Now, it was immediately after the fact. And so, throughout that two and a half, three year period of me living in uh, Pasadena before I got uh, arrested, there was always that sense that I didn't belong. And then, of course, I got arrested, so that just helped solidify that idea. And then, because of the arresting thing, my 
housing situation was unstable and I did end up in the, the um, sober living. But then they kicked us out two years later. They were kicking everybody out because they wanted to re renovate the place. I'm like, we're living here. Could you not? You know, it. it's not like we're living here to be there forever. It's we're living here because we want to save up so that we can transition or that we want to save up because where we're living is cheap enough and where we're making money is in is not enough. And we are trying to not only have a job that will pay for us to live there, but also to be able to <clears throat> then maybe find another job or go to school so that we can find a better job. And that's another thing too. It's like, in the first three years after I got back from Alaska, <clears throat> even though in Alaska I was technically not homeless, I didn't feel it because I knew the job wasn't permanent. And thus, because the housing was tied to the job, the housing was not permanent. Now, I got housing immediately on my way back. I, conver I conversed with somebody. When I got back, I booked like a, a hostel in Santa Monica for a couple of days and then I went to um, Pasadena and I, I was like the only person they they interviewed and I got the place. Cool. I was living in a living room for $300 a month, but I had like 10 grand. So that worked. I ain't doing that again. I'll live in a room, but not in the living room. <clears throat> In a lot of ways, I've been homeless since I've been in L.A. To be, to really put it, to put, a, to kind of put it into perspective. I get to L.A. I'm automatically homeless. That happens two and a half years. Then I'm at the. I've been living in the living room for three years, but this is directly after having been homeless on the streets. Sorry, I'm kind of processing that information, that thing that I just said about the fact that I've basically been homeless this whole time. And then, you know, trying to relate that information. <clears throat> so I get back from Alaska. I don't feel like I have a home. It starts to grow on me. It starts to get to a point where I feel like maybe I have a chance at stabilizing my life. And, coincidentally enough, I'm in a radio program. I have a potential internship within the realm of radio. And there's the potential of a minimum wage job in radio. <clears throat> and at the time, I was working at a shoe store that I hated. And literally the week before I got arrested, I had been going to work. Well, they, they, I, think, I think it may have been literally the week before. There was some sort of huge sale, so it was just two days of just constant work that was just grueling and it was hot and it sucked. And I had to work an extra day because the, it was a whole weekend. So they wanted us there on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And I wanted, I, I normally only worked on Saturday and Sunday at that job. And it didn't pay great. I mean, it was 15 an hour, which is the most money I've been making at any job. But it's only two days worth of work, so. And immediate, and you know, again, shortly after that, I mean, I was going to, like, during that weekend, I went to work kind of drunk. Like, not, I mean, it buzzed, but, you know, not so bad that I was, like, stumbling and shit, but, I mean, obviously, the heat plus the alcohol, my system didn't help, but. So there's that instability with the potential of this future and then, you know, trying to 
connect with this person who doesn't want to connect with me and because I find myself in spirals of depression and you know there's just a lot of overlap and I get drunk and make a dr drunken tweet and because I want cops come over and kill me instead I lose everything And so, <clears throat> even though I had a sense of home, it there was no real sense of home. And then I'm at, you know, after the three and a half weeks of uh, being in jail, and then the several days after the fact with no real housing prospects, for about two weeks, um, and then I finally get a spot in the sober living. And that place sucked. Bed bugs all over the place. Bed bugs in the couch that I was sleeping on. And then, you know, there wasn't any bed bugs in the beds that I was in. But then there was this rat that was in the fucking house. Oh, and then that rat decides to fucking die under my bed. Of all the beds in the entire house. There was like nine beds in that house. Dies under mine. And because, like, you move from the, like, the free couch to the bed with the two men in the room, or to the three-man room, and then you're paying, like, 300 a month for that, and then there's, um, the two-man room, and I stayed in that one for a bit. I was in the, and then I moved into the apartment, and so I was in the house for about six months, actually less, um... And then I stayed in the apartment for almost two years. My roommate was great. Literally had a birthday the day after mine. Like, he was born the day after me. I was born September 30th, 1981. He was born October 1st, 1981. <clears throat> we always had a lot of good conversations. But there was also times where he would get kind of crazy. Apparently he had been uh, taking speed. Which sucks because then he would get all paranoid and shit. Um, and I mean that housing situation wasn't stable because we all knew it was transitional. But I mean you know when you're not you're not getting good work. I was going to school still for radio. And then I finally got the job at uh, iHeart. iHeart wasn't a stable job either. I mean, when you're working 20 hours a week for 14 bucks and 14 something a week or an hour, it's not a lot of money. I mean, and then, you know, so we get kicked out and then my rent increases, but also my privacy decreases because I'm like, I don't have housing prospects anywhere. And so I end up in this sober living that's like six fifty a month for a bed, not for a room, for a bed. I'm like, I, I'm gonna tell you this right now: I'm, the sober living places that are offering that like five fifty or whatever for a bed, they're out to fleece people. They're out to make money. The dude who ran that house, like, he didn't, not once. And I had a good conversation with him, like not only the day of, but like multiple times after the fact. He was super gregarious and whatnot, and um, he sounds like those, because, like, I think he would say that he was, like, uh, like the nephew of some, like, really famous writer, uh, musician, etc., singer-songwriter. But the thing is, is, like, that was all he had going for him, was that he was the family, this extended family member of this super famous person. I'm like, it's fucking L.A., Chances are, that's probably true. And, you know, he had this nice-ass fucking car, and although he would do some nice things every now and then, there was this, there was something about the way that he discussed the nature of not only his life, but the life at the sober living. He was not there to help. He was there to make money. 
And while one might say, well, that's just one instance, look at the price of things. Look at what you're getting. And maybe it might be the same. People really like to take advantage of the disadvantaged. If desperate times call for desperate measures, let's go ahead and take advantage of their desperation. Yet another aspect of being homeless. In fact, I had something like that. I didn't even realize it when it happened. But it got I realized it at the end. So before I was going to Pasadena City College, while I was still technically homeless, um, so this was in my second year, at the end of the second year, because I was getting prepped to go to uh, PCC, I was reapproached by somebody I had met when I first came to LA while I was still traveling. He worked for Maker Studios. Um, if you don't know who Maker Studios is, they were a multi-channel network. So they were a network that then basically um, owned and operated and controlled a number of other actual YouTube channels. So it's like think of Machinima, if Machinima is something that you think of. But like this is a big deal back in you know the late aughts and early ten, early tens. Um, they aren't an issue anymore for the most part. Because either A, they've stabilized or they fucking disintegrated. Because the MCN situation was a goddamn nightmare for a lot of YouTube. But Maker Studios had a lot of uh, properties that they worked with. Ray William Johnson was under them. Uh, but because of the drama that happened with them, you know, and his show and, and so many other things. <clears throat> well, one of the dudes that I had met when I came out here for the first time Coincidentally, he was met. I, the reason I met him is because the girl that I had met in Flagstaff, who then we both went to Vegas and then came over into LA and then went uh, set part of our separate ways, he was her booty call. <laughs> and then my phone was dead when I was out and about and I needed to get back to the place that I was staying at. So she gets him to pick me up and drop me off. And then he and I kind of connected over a couple things, talking about YouTube and stuff. And so like two years later, she hits me up randomly because apparently he had hit her up or whatever. Um, and then he and I started talking and we met up and he, he had this idea that he wanted me to film like, because he liked some of the stuff that he that I had said on some of my older videos, because he had watched some of them after I had a, had that conversation with him. But then he wanted me to kind of document the world of homelessness, and I'm like, I don't fucking want that. Like, just because I'm homeless doesn't mean I want to be a documentarian of it. I would rather do that if I'm not homeless. I mean, I get the value in it. There were other people who were willing to do it. And then once it got to the contract signing phase, I was like, I ain't fucking doing this. It ain't happening. And so I got rid of that. Signed up for college. But what it felt like to me, and the reason for that story is because what it felt like to me was that he was trying to take advantage of my disadvantage. And again, like at that point, Maker Studios was going through some weird, like top level shit. Like the dude who ran it was, I think he may have been accused of embezzlement or something like that. And then there was, you know, stories about all kinds of drug related problems or whatever, you know, because coincidentally enough, even though people like to say, hey, if you give uh, poor people money, they'll spend it on drugs and shit. It's actually the opposite. The people who have more money are the ones who buy more drugs. Because drugs ain't cheap. Like, 
yeah, there's poor people out there who do buy drugs, but they are not the standard. They're not the common variable across. They're not the common denominator. The people who buy more drugs than anybody else are rich people. The people who blow more money on drugs are rich people. The more money you have, the more money you have for drugs. If you give poor people money, they'll buy stuff they need. Like food. They'll pay their bills. They'll fix a problem with their car that's been wrong for months or years that could literally cost them their lives or the lives of others. Home is where the heart is. Be it a person or a place. When there is a sense of safety, when there's a sense of belonging, when there is a sense of feeling at ease, content, that's when you are home. And I am homeless. Have fun.